Pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your presence. There's nothing like being in the presence of the Lord. Just 30 seconds in your manifest presence can make all the difference in our situation. And Lord, as we position ourselves by faith tonight, I pray that you'll refresh us, that you'll encourage us, that you'll teach us from your word, and God, that we can lead different than we came because of what you would do by your Holy Spirit. We'll give you the praise and the glory for all that's done in Jesus' name. Amen, amen.
that you're our Redeemer. You bought us back with your blood, Jesus, from sin, brought us back into salvation, into righteousness, because of that great price that you paid on Calvary. We thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord.
That doesn't give us an excuse to sin, amen? It makes us have a reason to not sin, amen? We can live a holy life because grace helps us to not have to keep sinning every day. Jesus freed us from that sinful nature. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. That's grace, isn't it? That he took our broken pieces and he made us whole. Amen. And this last song that we're going to sing, probably the greatest story in the Gospels of grace. The woman who broke the alabaster jar, washed Jesus' feet with her hair and her tears. And Jesus said her story would never be forgotten. Amen. And what an example of God's grace. She may not have deserved it. None of us do. Amen. But he gave her grace. Praise the Lord.
thank you, Jesus, that you've extended your goodness, your grace to us. God, we don't have to live bound up in sin anymore. We don't have to live the way we did before we came to Christ. Lord, we can be free. Lord, we just thank you for that tonight. We thank you for your great grace. We thank you for your amazing grace, Lord, that reached down and picked us up, cleaned us off, Lord. And though our sins were as scarlet, you made us white as snow. We rejoice in that tonight. We thank you. We give you our, our hearts. Have your way in the remainder of this service tonight. God, just teach us from your word. Make us a little bit more like Jesus as we're in your presence. We thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Message number three. If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter two, Ephesians chapter two, we're going to look at verses eight and nine tonight. And again, we're looking at the five solas of the Reformation. We've looked at sola scriptura last Sunday night. That we as believers, as Christ followers, we, if we're authentic, if we're genuine Christ followers, disciples of Jesus, will be living by Scripture alone. And most of the corruption and deception and false teaching, false prophets, uh, false doctrine that's been allowed in the modern church is a result of the modern church abandoning Scripture, abandoning the Word of God. And so we don't know when someone is teaching us wrong doctrine, wrong information. And so we need to get back to Scripture alone. Then this morning... We cover the second of the five solas, which is solus Christus, by Christ alone. We have, as we said this morning, justification. We have sanctification. We have future glorification. We're going home on those silver clouds of glory, as the song says, soon. Amen? Jesus is coming for His church in the resurrection, the rapture. We have that uh, because of Christ alone. All three of those uh, Parts to our salvation, if you will. Tonight, we're going to continue the series and look at the third of the five solas of the Reformation. And again, we've got some cards back there that have this very picture. Uh, it would be a good thing to put in your Bible as a bookmark, put on your mirror as a reminder of what we've been looking at in this series. But the third of the five solas of the Reformation tonight is sola gratia. And that's by grace alone. By grace alone. And we have, what's a typical definition of grace that most people give in the modern church? Undeserved mercy, undeserved favor, right? And that is not, there's nothing wrong with that definition, undeserved favor, uh, God giving us favor when we don't deserve it, but there's a lot more to it that I think we'll see in uh, what we look at tonight. Watch this quick video and then uh, we'll get into the word. It has become fairly traditional now that when we think about the Reformation and if we celebrate it annually or particularly this year with a very special anniversary, the 500th anniversary of Luther posting the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg, that we think of the great themes of the Reformation in terms of the solas and we probably should say soli since uh, uh, sola is a Latin word meaning only uh, or alone. And uh, we have come to summarize what the Reformation was about through those solas because it's so helpful, because it focuses on key concerns of the Reformation. And so we think of sola scriptura, uh, scripture alone, because the medieval church always believed in the authority of scripture, but they didn't believe in the authority of scripture alone. Or we think of uh, solus Christus, uh, Christ alone, the medieval church believed in Christ and in his work, but they didn't believe in Christ alone. Um, so with sola fide, by faith alone, the medieval church believed in faith, but not faith alone, um, the glory of God alone, um, and, and particularly sola gratia, uh, by grace alone, uh, because the medieval church very much believed in grace. One could almost say the medieval church dripped with grace, making grace available. But it didn't believe in grace alone. It believed that, by and large, you had to cooperate with grace for grace to become efficacious in your life. And the reformers really returned to the scriptures on this point and saw that if you make grace only available, then the real center of religion is going to be somewhere else. 
Uh, if grace is available but not actual in my life, then I have to focus not so much on the grace available as on the actualization of grace by my cooperation. And that's what the medieval church had really been captured by in its experience. And the reformers turning again to the scriptures discovered that what the scriptures really teach is grace alone. And of course, they would have said we could look almost anywhere in scripture and, and find a declaration of, of grace. But one that was particularly important to them and particularly clear is from Ephesians chapter 2, the well-known verses uh, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Uh, it's hard to think of it more clearly stated. It's God's work alone. It's God's plan from eternity. And one of the great themes recaptured by uh, Luther and Calvin was God's electing purpose from eternity. God knew what he was doing from the beginning. Uh, God had a plan and God accomplished that plan. So that uh, grace alone is not only about the plan of salvation in the heart and mind of God from eternity, but it's also about the actualization and experience of salvation as God works through his Holy Spirit to regenerate the hearts of Christians and draw them to himself on account of the work of Christ. So uh, sola gratia becomes one of the, the absolutely foundational elements of the Reformation because it draws us away from ourselves and focusing on ourselves and draws us to God in his great uh, saving work on behalf of his people. And that really is one of the great concerns of the Reformation, that God alone would receive the glory because he alone is the Savior. Again, another good synopsis of this sola, sola gratia, by grace alone. Good works are never the cause of our justification. And they were dealing with the Roman Catholics in their day, the Reformers' day, teaching that it's grace, yes, but good works with grace. And really the focus became more on good works than on the grace and goodness of God. But good works are never the cause of of our justification, they're never the cause of our sanctification, but they're always the result that we've already been justified, right? We've already been, become born again, and good works flow from a changed heart. We're good because God made us good, right? And so good works, what he calls good, can only flow from a changed heart by the help of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes we have it so backwards they did in the Roman Catholic Church and even still today. We think that if we do good works, then God owes us something. We don't say that out loud, but that's how we act. That's how we practice our Christianity. Well, God, I read six chapters of my Bible today. You owe me. You, you, I did what was behind door number one, so you need to give me this prize, this blessing. And that's not how it works. It works. God only blesses us because of our faith in who? Jesus and his performance. And when we have, when we come to the Father, the only way you can come to the Father is through Jesus, right? The only way you can approach Jesus is by way of the cross. If you come some other way, Jesus said in John chapter 10, you're what? A thief or a robber. He says, I am the door of the sheepfold. No man comes to the Father but through me. And if you try and come in some other way, you're a thief and a robber. And so our good works don't cause justification, sanctification, or future glorification, they're a result of God changing us by His Holy Spirit, by Christ's precious blood. Good works naturally just flow. Just like if you take a real plant, all these plants are fake in here, I think, mostly. If you took a real plant and you gave it good soil, and you gave it good water, and you gave it what else? Sunlight, mostly. You don't have to do much to that plant, right? It will grow. For a Christian, if we just position ourselves by simple faith, proper faith in Jesus and what he did for us at the cross, grace will flow and be uninterrupted, will flourish, will become what God wants us to be. And the Holy Spirit is there helping in that situation. And that's what we need to get a hold of uh, tonight. Why was, why is sola gratia necessary for reformation? Why was it necessary in uh, Martin Luther's day? Why is it necessary if we're going to see another move of God? 
in America in our day and age. Number one, because of what sola gratia means. And I think you can see it there on the screen. Sola gratia means justification, sanctification, and future glorification by sovereign grace alone. It was God's plan from the foundation of the earth. It wasn't your plan. In fact, before most of us came to Jesus, we had no plans to live for God, right? We were doing our own thing. But God had a redemption plan, a way for you to be redeemed. And that's justification, sanctification, future glorification by sovereign grace, not by our works, not by human effort. And that's different than what most were preaching or teaching from the Roman Catholic Church in Martin Luther's day. Look at this picture here, sola gratia, and it's grace alone, grace alone. Alone, the goodness of God, His unmerited favor towards us alone. His Holy Spirit working inside of us and changing us, making us good on the inside so that what flows out of us is good as well. That's grace alone. And that's what God wants us to be living our lives in. He read it, but we'll read it again. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. This very passage flies in the face of what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. And it flies in the face of a lot of what the modern church is trying to teach as well. Most probably teach salvation by way of Jesus and the cross, but they teach growth. They teach becoming more holy, becoming more the person of God that He wants you to be by some work or human effort. And uh, while we don't need to, again, be lethargic and lazy and just lay on our bed all day and say, God's got this, He's going to take care of it, and we never move a muscle, that's not Christianity. But uh, we, do, we do need to get up and, and position ourselves for God to use us. Our works don't accomplish it. It's Jesus' work upon the cross that brings grace, that brings a blessing. Listen to this quote from Brother Swagger. Grace as it pertains to the sacrificial offering of Christ on the cross. This grace is linked to the cross totally and completely. There is no other way to be saved than by grace. This means that we do not deserve salvation, cannot deserve salvation, and by rights we should go to hell and burn there forever and ever. But God has chosen to deal with man on the principle of grace which means unmerited favor, which means extended kindness, which means eternal riches of love, and to receive this benefit, this everlasting life, this glorious redemption, there is only one requirement, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, through faith. If we'll have the right kind of faith, we'll have grace flowing to us continually. When we first get saved, and 20, 30, 40 years later, when we're still walking with Jesus, if we're still looking to Jesus and looking to the cross through proper faith, there'll be that free flow of grace. Look at this quote from R.C. Sproul. He said, God Himself supplies a necessary condition to come to Jesus. That's why it's sola gratia, by grace alone, that we are saved. We have to meet God's conditions. Amen. We don't just make up something of our own, some kind of custom Christianity. Say, God, well, I did this good work. I, I wouldn't help the homeless. I read six chapters. I prayed two hours. I fasted 40 days in January. I mean, Lord, what more do you want from me to do this blessing in my life? God's going, well, if that's what it took, then my son died in vain. Right? And we make the cross of Christ, again, of none effect, if that's the way that we're going to go. It's God's redemption plan. He has extended grace to us, and we didn't deserve it. We better make sure that we're going his way, which is by way of the cross. Number two, why was, why is sola gratia necessary for reformation? Number two, because it was God's plan of redemption from the beginning. Christ's finished work and not our works. That was his redemption plan way back in Genesis chapter one. And we can see it throughout the whole Bible. It was his redemption plan from the foundation of the world. Titus chapter two, verses 11 through 14. Titus 2, starting with verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Can you see the work of grace in those verses? He's made his grace evident, obvious, undeniable to all, and, and it's telling us in these verses how we see that. Uh, we should be denying, we should be distinctly different than the world, not looking just like them and acting just like them. And that's what we see far too often in the modern church, isn't it? A bunch of people coming together and calling it church, but nobody's changed. Nobody's had their sins washed away. We're not living soberly and righteously and godly. We're not even concerned about Jesus' return in most of our churches in Colorado Springs. And He's coming. He's coming for those who are looking for His return. And uh, he, He's looking for a peculiar people. That doesn't mean weird. We use the word peculiar. And there are some weird people in this room. A lot of them in my own family. Uh, but He's talking about His own. The word peculiar means it's God's own. And he's coming for a people that are his own. He knows who belong to him and who are just talking a good talk. And he's looking for those who are zealous of good works. If you're saved, if you're born again, if God's grace has come into your heart and changed you, what's naturally going to flow from your life is good works. It's not a burden to you. It's what comes because the Holy Spirit's doing the work on the inside of us. Revelation 13.8 refers to Jesus as the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It was God's plan all along, right? That's what that phrase means, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We cannot do enough good works to outweigh our bad works and somehow earn or merit salvation or God's help after we get saved. God the Father saves us. God the Father blesses us. He extends His grace and goodness to us only when we exhibit exclusive proper faith in His one and only Son, Jesus Christ. Our Heavenly Father will never deny His Son. And so if we're hidden in Christ, we're going to have blessings. We're going to have grace. Amen? We're going to have the goodness of God working for our benefit, for our good. And that's what we should all be desiring as believers. We have grace because of Jesus alone and His performance on the cross, not because of us, or our performance of some set of religious good deeds. If that were the case, many of us wouldn't make it to heaven if it was based on us. But it's not based on us. It's based on Jesus. And His sacrifice was a holy sacrifice. He was sinless. He was the Son of God, yet the Son of Man. And so He could bridge the gap. And we better be trusting in His good deeds, not our own. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. It says this, Colossians 2, Starting with verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord. How was that? By way of the cross, right? By way of amazing grace. I was five years old. Riverside, California, Calvary Temple. Assembly of God Church. Pastor Mel Bennett was preaching, I believe, that night. He was the pastor, at least. Someone was preaching that night. Altar call was given. And at five years old, I felt such a sense of needing Jesus in my life. Again, I probably hadn't done anything that most of the world would consider sinful or wrong, but the Holy Spirit showed me I needed to be saved. I needed Jesus in my life. And I went down weeping and crying. I didn't know what I had done that was making me cry like that. It was the Spirit of God. And maybe you are that way. I'm a cry. When the Spirit of God moves on me, I start crying. And the same way you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, with humility and brokenness, weeping by way of the cross, he says, so walk in Him. Every day we shouldn't be calloused and jaded by the world and just don't have any feeling anymore like some Christians have become after years and years of living for the Lord. But we ought to still be humble and broken and contrite every day of our Christian life. Walking in Him, rooted and built up in Him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. How do we keep from becoming jaded to where we just don't care anymore, where nothing phases us, nothing moves us anymore? The key is in the end of that verse, abounding with thanksgiving. God, all that I have comes from you. All the blessings that I have is because of you, Jesus. I would have no healing in my body were it not for you. I'd have no peace of mind were it not for you, Jesus, my Prince of Peace. I'd have no provision, God, if it wasn't for you, Jehovah Jireh, 
being my provider. And we offer thanksgiving continually to God, not just one Thursday uh, every year at Thanksgiving, but every day. It keeps our hearts tender before the Lord. Amen? It keeps us pliable clay in the potter's hand that He can shape and He can mold. The same way you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, that grace that got you saved is the grace that will keep you saved. Amen? We need to keep going back to where that flow of grace comes from. And that's the cross of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> our justification or salvation is received as a benefit of God's grace when our faith is proper and our sanctification, our growth, or maturity is received as a benefit of God's grace as well when our faith is placed properly in Jesus and His finished work. Misplaced faith, you're going to have messed up grace, right? You're putting your faith in a man or an organization of man instead of Jesus and His finished work. You're not going to have the Holy Spirit bringing the amazing grace of God, His goodness, His kindness, His mercy at work in your life. You're going to have whatever that man or that organization of man has to offer, which in, when you're looking at eternity is not much, right? I'd rather have the amazing grace of God. So place your faith in Christ and Him crucified and keep it there, and you'll have a continual free flow of God's grace in your life each and every day. Number three, why is, why was, sola, gratia, necessary for reformation? Because without grace... All we do is frustrate what God is trying to do. Without grace, all we're going to do is frustrate what God is trying to do. There's a passage that I didn't include in here, but it talks about being fallen from grace. And uh, Brother Swagger was talking about it a little bit on uh, studying the Word this morning. And I was going, I should have included that in the message. And it was already, I'd already had the message prepared. But fallen from grace... Uh, most people think, Brother Stryker was talking about it this morning on a study of the Word. Most people think that if you've committed some big sin, what we call big sins, you, you know, uh, 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 an indiscretion with money, a sexual perversion of some kind, and you're a minister of the gospel, that then that's what mean, it means to be fallen from grace. And if that's the case, none of us are going to go to heaven. If it's a big sin that's being called, that's what uh, the Bible is talking about when it says fallen from grace, then we're all in trouble. No, there's hope for every sinner, no matter, how, no matter how far they've gone. That doesn't excuse what they've done. But falling from grace is when we're trying to find forgiveness. We're trying to operate as a believer some other way than by faith in Jesus and the cross. When you've done that, when you have a different object of faith other than Jesus Christ and Him crucified, you've fallen from grace. God can't minister, try, uh, allow the Holy Spirit to be the vehicle to bring grace to you if you've cut off your faith in Christ and Him crucified. There's a big gaping hole in the road, and the Holy Spirit in His truck, but full of grace, can't get to you because your faith is in something else other than Jesus and Him crucified. That's fallen from grace. That's frustrating the grace of God. God wants to give you His blessings. He wants to show you His kindness. He wants to do good works on the inside of you and through you to others. But if you will not keep your faith in Christ and Him crucified, if you look to yourself, you think I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, I'm a champion, right? Like the modern church is telling their congregations. You've, you're coming close to frustrating the grace of God. And if you continue regularly in that path, you will fall from grace. And God won't be able to give you, through His Holy Spirit, the grace of God that you need every day. Galatians 2.21, Paul said this, we know the verse before this, right? Paul the Apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then he said this, verse 21, I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness could come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We have to be denying self dying to self, going by way of the cross, verse 20, or what's going to happen, verse 21, we're going to frustrate the grace of God. We can't have Christ's righteousness clothing us. Boy, that's a dangerous place. If we're not clothed in Christ's righteousness, then the wrath of God is still hanging over our heads, right? Because He took the wrath of God upon Himself. We need to understand how serious uh, uh, a failure it is to frustrate the grace of God. 
And again, the greatest way we frustrate the grace of God, yes, sin in some respects frustrates God, but He has grace that is greater than all our sin. We sang about it tonight, amen? Doesn't mean we keep sinning, but having some great sin in your life that we label as great isn't falling from grace, isn't necessarily what this verse is talking about and frustrating the grace of God. That's an opportunity for the grace of God to work. Right? But what frustrates the grace of God is when you know the gospel message. You know about Jesus Christ and Him crucified for justification and for sanctification. And you still choose to put as the object of your faith something other than God's redemption plan. That's a dangerous place. Listen to this quote. If we do not permit the grace of God to operate in us, we will not be overcoming Christians. Religion says, I can do it. Relationship, relationship says, Christ can do it through me. Take your pick. Exchange dead religion for a living relationship. Amen? That's the choice we have to make every day. The Roman Catholic Church of Luther's day and the modern church today have both tried to add to Christ's finished work on the cross by human effort, and that's a dangerous place to be, a place where you make the cross of Christ of none effect, and quite possibly you become even an enemy of the cross of Christ. Paul the Apostle talked about that. Look at this quote by Martin Luther. The saved are singled out not by their own merits, but by the grace of the mediator. Amen. Who's our mediator? Jesus. Amen. He extends grace to us. We're significant because of who we are in Christ. Not because of just who we are or what we've done, but who we are in Christ. Find your identity in Jesus, and again, you'll have His amazing grace helping you. The Holy Spirit's hands are tied. He is hindered or even prevented from helping us if our faith is wrong. And if we're not trusting God's amazing grace, but we're trusting the work of our own hands, again, the Holy Spirit is driving the vehicle, the truckload of grace, it's so large it will just overwhelm you with God's goodness. He wants to bring it to you. But if you're not placing your faith where it needs to be, there's a gaping hole in the road and no bridge. No way for the Holy Spirit to get it to you. And God says, just simply believe me. Believe who the Bible says Jesus is, what the Bible said He did for you at the cross. And the Holy Spirit will keep bringing you truckloads of grace. Amen. He's the vehicle that God chooses to use to bring grace to us. Again, that's why you don't want to quench the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because He's the one who's bringing God's grace to you. His goodness. His unmerited favor. You don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Because, again, that's where our grace comes from. Look at this quote from Charles Wesley. Again, one of the reformers. He said this in 1738. It's actually, a, I believe this is a hymn. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin in nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off. My heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. Isn't that what it was like when the grace of God came to us? We were lost in a dungeon of darkness and sin, bound to our past. We couldn't escape. But Jesus brought us light. John Calvin said this. Look at this quote. Again, one of the reformers. And we don't agree with all of what some of the reformers uh, really, John Calvin, his teachings were taken to an extreme. Extreme Calvinism is once saved, always saved, that many Baptists believe today. But if you were to have John Calvin here today to defend himself, I doubt that he really believed in extreme Calvinism. They took his teachings to an extreme because he had some great uh, things that he did in the Reformation that we ought to be grateful for. And so... Uh, we just have to remember that when we're looking at the Reformers. Martin Luther, everything he said, we didn't necessarily agree with as Pentecostal believers today. But whoever is not satisfied with Christ alone strives after something beyond absolute perfection. If we want grace, if we want Christ working in our life, His goodness, His grace, which is perfection, we ought to keep Him as the object of our faith. Amen. Don't be looking to human effort don't be looking to another preacher or organization of man. Let's look to Christ and His amazing grace. Amen. We need His grace. Sola gratia. By grace alone are we saved. It's not our works. Our works add nothing to our justification. Our works add nothing to our sanctification. They're not the cause of those things. They're the result that we're already changed. 
That's why good works naturally flow from our lives. And let's make sure we have the uh, perspective right, as the scripture tells us. Would you stand with me tonight? I want us to close in prayer. If you're listening to this message, I believe most in this room have already given their hearts to Jesus. And when Jesus in John chapter 3 talked to Nicodemus about being born again, uh, most in this room understand what it means to be born again and have made that decision to have their heart cleansed from sin and surrender their life to Jesus, making Christ alone uh, what they're trusting in. But maybe you're listening to this Facebook Live or you're listening over YouTube or our podcast and you've not given your heart to Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, that doesn't mean you have to go into the old booth with the curtain and the priest on the other side and you open the curtain and say, Father, forgive me, it's been 200 days since my last confession. This is what I've done. I probably messed that up, but something like that, right? It's the old Roman. That's not what he's talking about, about confession. The word confession literally means that we're saying with God what he says about our heart. That's a serious thing. Because sometimes we like to play games with God, right? We like to take the rug and shove all our sins under the rug and say, God, I'm not that bad. At least I'm not as bad as Gabriel. Or I'm not as bad as Brianna, right? To make excuses. But we say what God says about our sin, and he says it's awful. He says the wages of sin is death. If we confess our sins, he says he's faithful and just to forgive us, and he'll cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Stop making excuses for your failures. Realize you can't fix them on your own and say, Jesus, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want to have my heart cleansed from all those guilty stains that I can remember. God, I don't want you to remember them anymore. I want you to forgive me and cleanse me. And not only that, God, I want you to break the sin nature, its power, its grip, its dominion over my life. And Jesus, I want you to be the master of my life. You can do that tonight. As we close in a time of prayer, I want you to just give your heart to the Lord. Tell Him that you are sorry for your sins, and not just sorry, but look, that you don't want to keep living like that anymore. That you want His forgiveness. And confess your sins to the Lord. Make Him the Lord of your life. Invite Him in as your Savior uh, as we close in prayer. Believers, in order to not frustrate the grace of God, but to have a free flow of His amazing grace, we need to position ourselves tonight. Can we do that one more time before we leave? Make an altar of prayer. Express our faith in Jesus and the cross. Say, God, my faith is still there. I still believe you. I got saved when I was five, but God, I still believe you. I still believe that your grace is enough. Express our faith in what Jesus did for us. Ask the Holy Spirit for not just justifying grace, but say, Holy Spirit, I want sanctifying grace tonight. Amen? I want to be set apart a little bit more. I want to become a little bit more like Jesus tonight. I believe God's going to do that work in us if we'll surrender our hearts. I want us to sing that song again. Uh, something beautiful, something good. It's an old song. I think we used to sing that when I was at Calvary Temple in Riverside, California back in the 70s. And the words are still powerful. Amen? What God wants to do is something beautiful, something good in our hearts. And if we'll get out of the way and let Him do the work that He's wanting to do, that's exactly what he'll do tonight, amen? And I don't know what struggles you're facing, what difficulties you're going through, but as we sing this song, would you just respond to God, give him your heart, express your faith again in Jesus and the cross, and ask the Holy Spirit for not just justifying grace, but sanctifying grace. God, help me to run this race to the finish line. Help me to grow and mature, amen? I believe the Lord wants to do something in our hearts tonight. And if you've not given your heart to Jesus, uh, as we sing this song, invite Jesus in. Amen. Get saved. Give your heart to Him tonight. Hallelujah.
Let's pray tonight. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done for us, your amazing grace. God, we stand here tonight so unworthy of your blood, so unworthy of that sacrifice that you made for us, that grace. God, I'm thankful that your grace is greater than all my sin. God, that even though I fail you often, Lord Jesus, you pick me up each and every time. You dust me off. You point me in the right direction. God, that's your grace. Lord, you don't condone sin. Lord, you don't uh, want sin to abound in our lives. But God, you give us your grace to free us from sin. And God, we thank you for that. Grace is not a license to keep on sinning. Grace is a license to live a holy life. God, it's all made possible because of your finished work. Help us to remember that tonight. God, let us uh, trust in your grace, not our own efforts. Not human effort, Lord God, not the philosophies of men or the ways of the world or the trends and fads even of the church. God, help us to be trusting in your grace alone in this Christian walk. Realizing, God, that we deserve death. We deserve hell because of our sins. But Jesus, you took our place. Lord, you accept us on the basis of grace and faith. We thank you for that. Lord, bless us as we leave this place tonight. Help us to put into practice the things that you've spoken to us from your word, both this morning and tonight. God, let us look for divine appointments, opportunities this week where we can sow a seed of the gospel in someone's life who comes across our path. We may never know, God, where that person's soul is going to end up. There's no guarantees in life. Let us be ready always to give an answer of the hope that is in us with meekness and fear. Let us see a harvest of souls. Let us see this church pointing people to Christ and Him crucified and seeing a difference made. We just give you praise, we give you glory, we give you thanks for all that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, amen, amen. God bless you.